Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today, we have got episode number 54 for you all, and we are going to be giving you our instant reactions from every single playoff series. Now, we are recording this Monday night, afternoon ish, before the this first set of game twos tip off. So every single playoff series has played at least one game so far. And we're going to be giving you our reactions from every single series. Cause like I said, we are locked in to the playoffs here. Did your PC freeze again? Oh, nah, I was say, good. now you just frozen. <laughs> For those of y'all watching or listening, we maybe made it three, four minutes into a recording and Dave's <laughs> PC just locked up completely. <laughs> oh, now I got PTSD anytime I don't see him moving. I'm thinking it's all frozen. <laughs> uh, but going to get the housekeeper out of the way again. Like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Stay tapped into all the playoff content that we're putting out on the socials at Off the Glass Pod, pod on Instagram, at Off the Glass Podcast on TikTok. Um, we're going to do it again. How are how, how we doing? How are we <laughs> yeah. feeling, Dave? Like I said before, could be better, could be worse, man. But we doing what we doing good. Excited to, you know, excited to watch some playoff basketball some more, man. You know, we got a lot to talk about today, so I'm excited to get into it. For sure. I'm gonna keep the Warriors joke in the chamber that I used last it, time. It, it's not gonna hit the same. We'll, right. We'll, <laughs> we'll get to them at some point because we definitely, definitely gotta talk about what their uh their offseason is gonna be looking like. Um, but I, I wanna go ahead and dive right, right in to the Western Conference playoffs. Game one, Nuggets take it in Denver on their home floor, 114 to 103. Uh, like I said before, your PC froze. Anthony Davis, I think, played as good of a game as I could have expected him to play on both sides of the floor. I thought he was great defensively. Mm-hmm. I thought he was very aggressive offensively, um, working out of the post, um, doing a lot at the rim, getting seals, actively calling for, demanding the basketball, and getting fed um, by his teammates. So, like to see that that was a, a huge part of the Lakers' game plan, which it always should be: is AD get aggressive on both sides of the ball. You know, it's going to be taxing and demanding, but um, when he's able to get into that mode and, and giving you thirty plus a night with the defensive impact, the Lakers are going to be a very hard team to beat. And this was a very close game all the way down the stretch. Um, but the Nuggets continue to execute at a ridiculously high level. It feels like they're starting to give me the uh, Warriors vibes when they were at the, the peak of their powers where it feels like no lead is safe. You're always like a quick two, three possession run from having your, your 12 point lead be wiped down to two instantly. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Nuggets have those, those spurts of, of offensive excellence um, and, and I think it happened right before the half. They were down by 10 or 12 when they cut it to a tie game. Um, and then, again, down the stretch, Jokic was was the best player in the world, um, continued to operate at a very high level, 32, 12 rebounds, seven assists. Um, so I'm just going to start with you being the resident Lakers fan here. What did you see um, from your Lakers? Do you have any optimism here? Um, like I said prior, I put out my my full bracket on Twitter. I do have the Nuggets officially as my pick in this series in six games. So not anticipating a sweep. And I, I, I have some optimism that there's enough here for the Lakers to be able to, to potentially get one or two um, throughout the course of the series. But but coming from the Lakers fan, how are we feeling after game one? Uh, it's, it's mixed emotions after game one, man, because part of me – I guess we'll, we'll talk about the good first. Like you said, Anthony Davis played well. Um, Anthony Davis was aggressive on offense, aggressive on defense, was able to attack Jokic um, on the offensive end, which was great. You know, like I said, demanding the ball. Um, you know, he was just he was just doing – he had an all-around great game. I feel like Anthony Davis played a very well-rounded game. Um, so that's one of the positives. I mean, obviously, LeBron – I feel like from the start of the game was kind of locked in, was aggressive, was like, listen, we can come out here and, you know, try to punch him in the mouth at least and then, you know, for, go from there and see what happens. Um, that's always good, but the problem with the Lakers is, well, I guess it's not even the, it is a problem with the Lakers, but it's more so a credit to the Nuggets, bro. One mistake, any sort of window to let them back the game and it's over, bro. It's over. I'm telling you how, what I felt like would change the game was D'Angelo Russell. It was a play where he had a turnover on a fast break, I think, and Mm -hmm. then he missed the layup. And I don't even know what happened after that, but I just 
you literally could feel the game shift after those two plays right. and never look back. Like, that's the biggest thing. I think LeBron talked about as well. was like, listen, you cannot make any mistakes against this team. She was, no. well, like, way too well-rounded, way too great in, in all aspects of the game and have the best player on the planet to top everything all off to the point where – I think I told you this before. When I'm when I'm watching the Lakers play, I don't even just the Lakers, a LeBron James-led team, I'm like, I have full confidence they're going to win the game all the time like no matter whether it's the playing games whether it's like playoff series whether it be like any just close games in general if it's a lebron james led specifically lakers team because obviously i'm a lakers fan i'm like yeah we're gonna win i like i'm not worried at all unless it's against the nuggets because <laughs> you got that with Jokic. you know what i mean like yo like he will always bring you home and end up winning these type of games and i guess the biggest problem is the fact that it's Part of it is really showing signs of the last year series, which really scares me, bro. Which is D'Angelo Russell when the lights are bright, is he's out here folding again. Which I really want to like hold out hope because I, one is just game one. At the end of the day, everyone's gonna overreact to all these game ones, mm -hmm. but that was bad. I'm not gonna lie, that yeah. was a terrible showing in a game where I felt like. If he just has a normal game, I feel like it's, it's a completely different game because, like you said, Yogi, I mean, obviously, Yogi's going to get his numbers, but at least stats wise, AD kind of matched Yogi a little bit. Um, obviously, impact is a little bit different, but then again, mm -hmm. Anthony Davis' defensive impact is great as well. Um, Jamal Murray didn't like he hit timely shots because that's just what he does, but he didn't like absolutely drop 40 on us. Like, it felt like he did in every, every game last series. Um, the problem was, like I said, LeBron James played good, Anthony Davis played good. The others couldn't really get it going that much. Um, and then with the Nuggets, it just felt like the others hit timely shots. You got KCP in timely shots. Michael Porter Jr. Like, they just – everyone just plays well, and they do at the right times to where the Lakers just felt like LeBron, AD, and nobody else really stepped up. And that was the biggest thing. I guess you could have optimism and say, like, okay, the others play, play better. You know, they're in some of these games towards the end. But then you could just say, like, look, that's what happened last year. You just assumed that the others were going to play better, and they just never right. – so yeah, you can look at it from both both sides of it. Um, it's definitely not over because I mean, if we're being honest, like they're supposed to win both of these games at home anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, would have been nice to steal game one. Absolutely. Would I have overreacted to the fullest degree if we won game a one? A lot of 100%. people would have. Hundred percent. Out Lakers in seven. We went in the tip. We run in the tip, bro. Oh my god, if we won game one. I would have lost my mind, but. You know, it's, it's like I said, the series isn't over. It's still young, but um, saw some good things, saw some bad things. Yeah, D'Angelo Russell, uh, six for twenty, like you said, is not going to cut it. I don't expect him to to go that poorly of a showing again. A lot of the shots that he missed were makeable, makeable shots for him. Um, so I, I expect him to to play better. He's he's going to have to play better for the the Lakers to have any any chance in the series. Um, but. Same thing if you want to flip it the other way, like just to play devil's advocate, like Jamal Murray went nine for 24. Um, so it's like he didn't have the greatest showing either. Michael Porter Jr. stepped up and hit some timely shots. Again, Jokic is doing Jokic stuff. 32 on 15 from 23 from the field. KCP ended up with four threes as well. Payne Watson was able to come off the bench and hit a couple of threes. Um, so the Nuggets got just enough bench production, which is – Crazy because when you really look at their bench, like their bench is so weak compared to a lot of the other teams, really in the NBA, but especially in the West. But they give you just enough that this starting five unit, which is the best starting five in the NBA by the advanced metrics, continues to be dominant. Um, the biggest thing for the Lakers and, and really any team that faces the Nuggets this year, and I think I even texted you. I just don't know if the Lakers have enough size to do it because having one big is no. not enough. No, it's not, not enough. Um, and, and and to be quite honest, like I, I I understand that the AD put him off on maybe like Aaron Gordon or somebody he can help off and be that kind of Roma on the backside, have Rui play Jokic head up in a lot of the actions. I, Rui's not big enough. Like it's no knock on him. It, there's not a lot of people in the NBA big enough. And I saw that Christian Wood supposedly might be ready for game three of this series. That doesn't move me at all, to be honest no, with you. Like, I saw people saying, like, man, this size is going to be – it's needed, it's needed. 
It's not I, like what is what is Christian Wood gonna do with Jokic? It's inside not good the size. The side, like just don't. When you say size, that don't just mean just throw anybody over six ten. It's like actual right. someone who can bang down there and is an actual like solid defender. Like yeah. just throwing out anybody that's a big is not size. That's not the size we're right. talking about. Yeah, I, I, if Jackson Hayes had a little bit of a different skill set, I'd love to see him take a stab at it. But him and Anthony Davis on the opposite side of the ball is a little suspicious in that I feel like you have to put LeBron off ball a lot just to make the spacing even make sense. And it, it, it messed up the flow too much on the other side for, for Darvin Ham and the Lakers. So he's definitely got his work cut out for him for sure to try to, to figure out what he's going to do. I think I saw he said a quote that, they're going to throw the kitchen sink at the Nuggets, which I, I sure hope so because it's been 10 straight games now at this point at the Nuggets have beaten the Lakers. So empty the tank, Darvin, please, for, for your sake, because people are trying to call for your job, bro. Empty yeah. the tank. Yes, yeah, the size thing is a big problem because I've, I've been talking about it. Like, I don't know why we ever strayed away from what won the Lakers a championship in 2020. Like Dwight we beat and JaVale and, we you know. beat. Granted, this is not the Jokic is better. Like that's just right. he's better. The, it, the team is a the lot team is, better. As the a team whole. is better, yeah. but still, you at least saw the recipe to somewhat slow him down. It was size. It was bodies. And granted, it's a little bit different back then because AD I felt like played a little bit more on the perimeter. Like right now, they kind of transition. Anthony Davis, till he's a center. Like, he's not right. a power four. Like, they made him a center, which is tough because, you know, Anthony Davis in, like, 2020 and, like, closer to his prime could play on the perimeter a little bit more. He was knocking down some threes from time to time. Um, he was less of a tr- uh, of a center and more of an actual power forward who, to where him and AD on – not him and AD, him and Dwight on the court, him and Javel on the court wasn't, like, absolutely killer for your spacing. Now it would be a little bit different because Anthony Davis, he's – the three pointer is just kind of gone at this point. Um, like I say, he's transitioned to a traditional center, put on more weight, but him alone, he's not gonna be able to stop Jokic. He's just, it's just not enough. Like, just they just need more bodies, and it's tough because I mean, obviously, you can't add bodies now, it's too late for that. So, it's just a little bit frustrating seeing, um, at least a recipe that could possibly work or it possibly, um, help them lead to some wins. The Lakers stray away from that, it's a little bit frustrating. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was. The, I think that's the biggest thing. Obviously, the others have to step up more. Um, Lakers also had to win the non Jokic minutes. I feel like there was a stretch. I forget what at what point in the game it, what what point of the game it was at. But I think AD was on the court. I don't think LeBron was on the court. I think LeBron and Jokic were both off. But yeah, I think uh, that was to start the to start the fourth. Yeah, and they went on a run, and I'm just with no Jokic on the court. I'm like, yeah, it's over. Like you're not. Yeah, there's no way you're telling me you're gonna. You, and anytime Jokic is off the court, you have to dominate those minutes. Like it has to be like. Yeah. It can't even be like they're holding up. You have to absolutely win those those minutes. Um, and once they didn't do that, they, that game was over. Yeah. Uh, LeBron's first shot, I have it down here in my notes, his first shot in the fourth quarter came with 35 seconds left when the game was was already decided. Yes. Yeah, can't, can't happen. happen. It, it, it can't happen. Uh, and that's, I, that possession where I think AD got the offensive rebound and LeBron got it and he missed the layup and he got his rebound back and he missed another layup and then it spilled out like, it, it genuinely looked like he he really ran out of gas down the the stretch in that game, which a hundred percent understandable. The man is thirty nine, but you going up cooked, against the though. huh? Then they're cooked though. I mean, like he's our best player. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like they're I don't know, man. They kind they're kind of cooked. It it's it's tough personnel wise. I really just as. Good and as well as the Lakers match up to a lot of the other teams in the West, like most teams in the NBA, like they just don't match up well against Jokic and the Nuggets. One of the only teams I think that has a a realistic chance schematically in my head from just the personnel that they have is the next team that I want to talk about, which is Minnesota. Mm-hmm. All right. Who came out and uh Ant Man let it be known that the the, the new generation, it's not, they're not next up. They're here now. I love, oh love, love that that uh moment between him and KD when Anthony Edwards is going on his run in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. And he's talking his shit to KD. Facts. You can see KD smiling back, just being appreciative of the moment. That's you for anybody that 
you know, you can knock KD on a lot of things for a lot of decisions that he's made throughout his career, things that he said. You cannot knock the fact that he really is just at his core a hooper, bro. And God clearly just yeah. loves the game of basketball. Um, now it's evident in a playoff game, like getting, you know, trash talk by – a 22, 23 year old, like he's just loving it. Like that's the type of competitor that he is. Um, but Anthony Edwards ends up with 33 in this one. I think he he had, I think, 18 or 20 in the third quarter alone. He went on a ridiculous run. Nobody on that Suns team can check him, bro. I don't like, I don't know why they got KD. <laughs> they got KD <laughs> trying to sit in a chair. Please, bro. Somebody else gotta gotta step up and guard that man. They don't got nobody. I mean, we've been saying this all year, though, right? Like, I've, I've been do said it. it. I've been uh, said it, man. Yeah, I I don't know. They're gonna have to try Royce O'Neal or Josh Kobe. Like Frank Wall was gonna have to tap some different buttons there uh, because it, it it can't be KD for long stretches of the game, and it's. No knock to him. I mentioned it when we were putting together all NBA teams. I thought Kevin Durant had a great defensive season this year. He's not going to stick Anthony Edwards on the perimeter for no. 48 minutes in a playoff game. No, um, not at all. So, yeah, I I think the Suns are in big, big, big trouble in this series. Um, I, I saw people say, you know, you're not going to expect Devin Booker to have the bad performance that he did. I think he ended, he ended up five for 16. I don't even think Grayson Allen made a field goal in this one either. So they're definitely going to have better showings. But at the same time, Mike Conley had one of his worst playoff performances ever, two for 12 from the field. I don't expect that from a, a veteran um, of his caliber. Nas Reed came in and Big Jelly, showing off Big Jelly moves. I love Nas Reed, um, Nas Reed bro. Nas Reed is yeah, nice. I still this, want him in the Lakers. That's crazy. <laughs> this Timberwolves <laughs> team is deep. Uh, they've got – it looks like their eight- to nine-man rotation really sorted out and ready to go for the playoffs. Um, and they look very, very good. They look like a dominant force that they've been all year out west. And the biggest thing that, that I saw from this game, Rudy Gobert multiple times was switched out onto the perimeter against KD, against Booker. And one of the best possessions he did it against Bradley Beal and he's not giving up any space. Said it uh, last episode, we were talking about him for Defensive Player of the Year. His leaps and ability to be able to be switchable and not get played off the court, you have to tip your cap to that. Um, so Rui's been significantly better out on the perimeter. But I don't know, man. What do you think about the Suns' chances in this one? Because I know we've both been very critical of them this entire season, and uh, I'm very I, – I don't expect them to win, and I'm – even more nervous of how they came out game one. Yeah, I, I picked the Timbos to win this series before they even played the game one. And game one, obviously, you don't want to overreact to game one, um, but that just kind of confirmed what I already thought. I already felt like personnel-wise, granted, you're never going to fully stop Bill, Booker, and KD, especially not all three of them. Like, one, one if not two, is bound to have a good game, if not go off. But I feel like if anybody had the personnel, the, the perimeter defenders, um, the, the paint defenders, anyone had the personnel to at least slow those guys down, or at least a couple of them down, it would be the Timberwolves with all mm -hmm. those plus defenders they do have on that team. Um, and I feel like we talked about it with Anthony Edwards. I just don't think they have anyone who can stop him. And I tr I personally – listen, we talked about breakout players before the season started, and I was like, Anthony Edwards won. He could be – put. Uh, granted, I say he potentially be an MVP conversation. Little did I know Luka and Jokic and Joel was going to – play like prime Jordan. I didn't know that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but just as far as having a really good, you know, all NBA caliber season, I definitely did. We both definitely did say I think Edwards is capable of that. And I feel like we both knew that he wasn't, he was never going to be afraid of this moment. Um, He was going to be like a playoff riser, someone who will step up in these moments. So I do trust the fact that him leading this team, you know, he can get in there offensively. And then it's with all these solid defenders around them to kind of frustrate and make all these guys uncomfortable on the Suns. It's just, I don't think it's a good matchup for him. Um, I don't think, like we talked about, they haven't been playing great already, like leading into mm -hmm. the playoffs. Um, and the Timberwolves was, was kind of rolling. Like I said, even without Carl Anthony Towns, was able to keep a top three seed, was able to, you know, still win games down the stretch against good opponents as well. I just don't think this is a good matchup for the Suns. And honestly, like, like I said, don't want to overreact to game one because things can definitely go differently. 
but mm-hmm. I just don't really see a a real chance in them winning this series. Like they can make it tough for sure. Like I said, if when you have Book, Bill, KD, especially Book and KD, like they can just flat out go off for a few games and get hot and mm-hmm. end up winning a few. So they can make it tough. But I realistically, I don't think they're. I wouldn't predict them to to win this series. Yeah, I think I think Book and KD and Bradley Bill like they'll have a game or two where it'll just be it'll just be too much offensively. They'll get hot, they'll get rolling, and that'll uh, that'll that'll give them a game, maybe two. I don't really see the series going any more than six games. I think Minnesota will be able to wrap it up. Um, and what was interesting to me is I saw a lot of people say it felt like this was a bad matchup for Minnesota because of the firepower that. That, yeah. that Phoenix brings offensively. And uh, their struggles in the half court offense, not necessarily being able to keep up. What I think a lot of people overlooked, and the reason why I feel so confident in picking Minnesota in this series, man, this Phoenix team is soft, bro. Like, and Mm -hmm. that's not the the most, you know, analytical take, but just really like watch them play. Like, they are not as physical as a team as you need especially in this year's Western Conference, to really make that kind of deep run. They were uh, got out-rebounded by, what is this, 24, 13-3 to three on the offensive glass, 39-25 to 25 on the defensive glass. Um, they're just not physical enough. Nurkic is not that guy that's just going to be able to and, and be that bruising force inside and just, you know, be that, that physical presence. And, and that kind of emanates out throughout their entire rotation. Um, so I feel like they're a team that can and, and will get bullied on the, the boards by Rudy. They're going to get bullied by the length and just the size and physicality that Minnesota brings to the table. This is a hungry and young Minnesota team um, who were able to last year take a game off of what ended up being the champion in the Denver Nuggets. Um, and they're, they're hungrier than they were last year. They played a significantly better season last year. Um, right at the top to potentially, you know, one game behind of being the one seed out West. Like they have very, very high aspirations in Minnesota. Um, so they are going to keep the foot on Phoenix, Phoenix's neck um, in this series. So like I said, I don't expect to go on more than six. I think, like I said, Katie and book and Beal can, will get you a game or two, but I just don't see it that they have, an answer defensively for what Minnesota presents and really what Anthony Edwards presents. Um, and then additionally, I just don't think that they're physical enough. It's not going to be enough. It's they're too devoid Had a lot of positions. Like we've said all year to, to really make a meaningful run. Yeah. No, it's roster construction, man. But like I said, we've been talked about that. They just don't have the, the personnel needed to beat, a Timberwolves team and honestly just to make a playoff run in general there's way too many holes way too many question marks that just they think will just get patched up by book bill KD scoring points like they just think that that's just gonna solve everything and realistically especially in the playoffs it's it's just not so I I don't really see a world I agree with you I don't think it goes past six um yeah I'd, I'd say, yeah. I didn't. I never gave a number uh, how many games I feel like they'd win, but if I had to pick, I'd say six out of respect for, like we talked about, them just going off for maybe a game right. or two. So I'd say probably Temple wasn't six, but I don't think it's going past that. Uh, before we move on to the next series, I do got to say once again, continually I am frustrated with watching this Suns offense, just the lack of actions. Like, where could we come up the court? Here comes Bradley Bill, high pick and roll, and that's it. Everybody just stand around. I mean, have come a- up the court, high pick and roll. Everybody just stand around. Like it's so your turn, my turn. Like this is the NBA, bro. It's not that easy to just go out and just give people buckets like that. This game is a clear indicator of that. Like do you think? Do you, you think it's coaching wise, or creative. you think it's coaching wise, or is the fact they don't really have a point guard? It's definitely a combination. Like you don't not having a point guard was the decision that was. I, I would imagine, obviously I'm speaking from, I don't know for certain, but I imagine this decision that was made between the front office and Frank Vogel um, to just roll out with Devin Booker as the point guard. And he's not a bad playmaker by any stretch of the imagination, but that's, you mentioned before, like that's not what you want Devin Booker to have to be focusing on. Devin Booker should be focused on getting Devin Booker going. Devin Booker shouldn't have to focus on getting Kevin Durant and Bradley Beal and Grayson Allen and Yusuf Nurkic going. Worrying right. about distributing the ball like that, 
you're putting way too much onto his plate there. And as a byproduct of that, then you just aren't running stuff. Like, I'm, go back and watch it. If you're really, like, not believing in it, watch their possessions. Look at when people come up the court, what happens. It's just one screen, and that's it. There's no off-ball action. There's no no pin downs. No, like, there's no cohesiveness. It looks like a pickup game on one side of the court mm-hmm. sometimes. Um, and that's that's really unacceptable. I was never a huge fan of the Frank Vogel hire, partially because I feel like they brought him in to be a defensive coach, and they were just were like, well, he could just patch up a great defense even if we don't give him great defenders. Now their offense looks like crap at times, too. Like, I, I, I can't wait to get to the Suns offseason because <laughs> I don't think they're going to make it out of this, this first round. And I have a lot, a lot of issues with them all year. But we're going to move on to another – blowout game really um ended up being closer than i think the final score indicated but the clippers were in very very big control of this game from wire to wire end up winning by 12 uh 109 to 97 on their home court in los angeles harden can i say vintage harden you know his playoffs be up or down but it felt like a Harden. right, it's a, a vintage Harden game. He was giving you the assists, he was giving you the lobs, he was giving you the tween tween step back that he patented in Houston. Zubak turned into Kareem Abdul Jabbar for about the first eight minutes of this game. Nobody on the Mavericks could could handle him on any of his post touches or any of his inside touches. Uh, a struggle shooting wise for Luca, eleven of twenty six from the field, 4 of 12 from 3. Uh, it's one of the worst shooting games for the Mavericks as a team all season. Um, and they are now in a one old hole. I'll say again, I have the Mavericks in seven games prior to this game one tipping off. I still have the Mavericks in seven games. I am eh, a little bit concerned because uh, of everything that I could have expected to happen in this series, a, the Clippers playing game one without Kawhi and the Mavericks losing, not a good look. Not a, at all. Losing like this, really not a good look. Two, Zubac being that much of a factor off the rip, that is major problems, bro. <laughs> major problems. If y'all listen to the Mind the Game podcast, uh, LeBron said something really, really particular to the playoffs that said, like, you have each team has certain guys that you know is going to get there. So you kind of have to game plan sometimes. I think it, it pivoted to J.J. Redick talking about this happening to him where they would, like, essentially ice him out of a series when he was with the Clippers. It was mm-hmm. like, CP is going to do CP things. CP things. Blake Griffin is going to get his lobs. He's going to get his dunks. We cannot let J.J. Redick get his two or three threes a game. We just can't. Yeah. It cannot happen. Letting Zubac get 20 feels like something that y'all just can't allow to happen. You know what Paul George is going to give you. You know what Kawhi, if he's playing, is going to give you. You know what you can expect out of Russ and Harden. You can't let a guy like Zubash get going or Norm Powell come off the bench or get going. Like You got to isolate where that production is coming from. So for him to come out the gate aggressive and dominant like that, it, it gives me a little I'm, – I'm a little, a little afraid for Dallas. Um, but what did you see in this one? Uh, because it's, I think this is going to be a dog fight of a series. Yeah, no, this is going to be a great one. But, uh, <laughs> my problem was like, I didn't expect for this to happen. That's the thing. Like, if you told me that the Clippers won, one, I'd say, okay, Kawhi played. Like, that's the big thing. But even if Kawhi didn't play, you say the Clippers won. I mean, they're still a good team. Like, think about it, even a team with Paul George and James Harden, if they're both right. playing on their weather, the level that they can play on, like, that's still a good like that's still a good team in general without Kawhi. 100%. And yeah. then you add in good role players, you add in shooting, you add in Ty Lue as a great coach and yeah, you know, that's a good team. But it's the fact that they got punched in the mouth. Like you would think that they'd come out hungry like okay, Kawhi's not playing. Let's steal this game. Like this is the one we should steal. Um and then, you know, we can go up from there, but like the biggest like I said, Zubox getting you 20 and 15 and and the, it was just the way that it happened. It was like he was bullying them. Yeah. Like he was legit bullying them. Gafford so, and PJ stood no chance. They had no chance against him to start out this game. Not, none whatsoever. So that to me was very, very concerning. Um, 
the, obviously, like I said, the, I feel like the Mavericks, it kind of, it started from the jump that they, they really couldn't hit shots. Like, no one on the team could hit shots. And it kind of just, the momentum kept going to the Clippers side and the way they did. It just, it seemed like they were just off. Like, everyone was just off. They knew the momentum was not on their side. And it just kept trickling down, trickling, trickling down to where everyone was missing. And it was just playing bad. It looked like they was playing sloppy. Like, they just looked so, like, like they slept walk through this game, which is mm-hmm. very unexpected for a team. Like I said, if you know that Col- their best player is not playing, I feel like that's an opportunity. You got to seize that moment. So to me, that was a little bit tough. Um, you could look at it from the standpoint of like, obviously, you know, we're not going to shoot that bad again. Luca maybe is not going to shoot that bad again. But it's just a little bit frustrating knowing that you kind of you drop this one. And this was the one I felt like. This is the easiest one to steal without Kawhi there. So who right. knows if he, you know, when he comes back in this series. But I just felt like you got to take the opportunities when they do come. And this definitely was a was a missed opportunity for the Mavericks. Yeah. Uh, Jason Kidd, you, my friend, are on the hot seat. You better figure this out, bro. Yeah. First round exit for this Mavericks team. And excuse that me. Might be your, yeah, that might be your job, to be honest with you. That might be his job. Um. Gafford came out after this one and he ended up only playing 14 minutes. Like you said, he just he could not handle uh, Zubach early on. He said that his play in that game was, was inexcusable. He came out, he t- took accountability for it. Like I said, I do not expect Luka Doncic to shoot 11 from 26 <laughs> again in this series. Um, I think that they are, are more than capable – especially between him and Kyrie of erupting and, you know, quickly evening up this series in game two. Um, But Jason Kidd defensively has got to get them locked in and tightened up because they were just giving up everything to start uh, this game, got themselves in such a hole on top of the offensive woes. I mean, they had 30 points at halftime, eight points in the second quarter. For a team with Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving to score eight points in a quarter, can't happen. It can't happen. And like you said already, in a game without Kawhi, that's a blown opportunity. So Mavericks, is, it's a little dicey. I'm not going to switch up on my pick. I still think that they can get it done in seven, uh, especially if Kawhi's injury seems like it's as bad as it might be. feels like he'll probably miss a couple more games. Um, but – We'll have to see. This is one that is going to, I think, no matter which way it goes, I think is going to be a seven-game series. It's going to be a dogfight. Um, and it was one of the most anticipated series because of the the history between these two teams going into it. Yeah, no, I, I still think the Mavericks will win this series. Um, just for a lot of factors that I don't think – I don't know how repeatable it is. Like I said, Lucas shooting is bad. The Mavs as a team shooting is bad. Zubox being the greatest center of all time. James Harden, you know, eventually he's going to fold. I just feel mm-hmm. like that's inevitable at this point. We've reached a point where his career where it's not like a maybe this is the year. No, bro. he's It's going to happen. This is, I wouldn't be surprised if next if next game he scored five points. I would not be surprised. It would not <laughs> shock me not one bit. So, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of things that you can't really predict. Um, but I do mm-hmm. agree. It's going to be a good series regardless if Kawhi ends up playing um, or not. But, um, but, yeah, it's just a tough one because I, I – Genuinely thought the Maz was definitely gonna definitely gonna come out a little bit with a little bit more fight to that or to yeah. them than this. Oh, uh, another team playing without their best player is the New Orleans Pelicans, and boy, they gave the Oklahoma City Thunder all they could handle for 47.9 minutes. <laughs> they came down to that very, very last possession. Shout out Kason Wallace for being a rookie. Um, only playing 19 minutes in this one, checks in on the very last possession of the game and locked up C.J. McCollum to secure the victory for the Thunder, who win this one 94-92. to um, This was a, a – felt like a heavyweight bout. It was just back and forth over and over, lead change after lead change. Um, lots of tough shots being made on both sides. Chet, I think, played – great in this game his impact defensively was huge five blocks um his activity was huge he's able to to show up on screens and really get and drop back to the rim and provide help there um you know this is it's great to see just how young this team is um 
Obviously, this is their first time. This is the youngest one seed. They kept talking about on the broadcast. Youngest one seed in NBA history. Um, but they are are up for the challenge. And this Pelicans team is not going to back down, and they didn't in this one. Um, we knew that they were going to be able to out-physical the Thunder. A lot of teams have been able to do that. They out-rebounded them on the offensive glass 18-8, to eight, um, which is huge. They were able to get up 11 more shots in total um, than the Thunder in this one. Um, but – at the end of the day, when they needed him most, they put the ball in Shea Gilgis Alexander's hands. And I, the call on the broadcast was perfect because he did his move and he pulled up and the announcer goes, Shea, money on the table. Got it. And he cashed out his nice little signature mid-range jumper. Um, and I don't think that the, the Thunder turned the lead back over at that point. He ended up with 28, six rebounds, four assists. Um, not his most efficient night by, by any stretch of the imagination. You're going to expect that. The Pelicans have a lot of lengthy defenders and high-quality defenders to throw at him. It's going to be a tough series for him. But they prevail in game one in OKC. Again, no Zion for the Pelicans. I don't know what his timetable is. I think when he first got hurt, they said he'd be reevaluated in two weeks. So he might miss at least the first three games in this series, which – I ended up taking the Thunder in five, expecting that. Um, still feel pretty confident that they'll be able to wrap up this one in four or five games. I gave the Pelicans one just because the Thunder is a young team, and they might slip up here or there, but I think they should be able to make pretty quick work of New Orleans. But how you feel about this series so far? I just want to preface this by saying I was so mad. I had a little too much to drink, and I fell asleep and missed the fourth quarter. Oh. I, I woke up at 3 a.m., Livid, like I was <laughs> so mad. I did rewatch it, but I was so mad I couldn't see it live. But um, but yeah, honestly, I I felt like realistically this was just a battle between two teams that's very very young teams. Um, Pelicans, mm-hmm. I believe, with the, I believe they have a little bit more experience in the playoffs than Thunder. Definitely. Well, yeah, definitely a little more experience than Thunder. But um, but yeah, because I I feel like you felt that in this game, like especially on the OKC side, a little bit. Um uncomfortable at times um i feel like obviously the defenders for the pelicans made it like very very tough because obviously we know how great of a defensive team that the pelicans are and how many good defenders they do have on that team so it made it a little bit tough but the biggest thing i can give credit to him about is the fact that you know when you have the mvp candidate in shea gillis alexander when there's times where i believe they went on a stretch where they didn't score for i don't know how long it was but they just felt like they could not get a bucket um and like you said stepped up Hit a, hit a timely mid-range jumper, um, that stepped up, played defense when they needed him to. I just felt like, you know, when you have that caliber of player, he's going to do that in those moments, which is good to see at this point, especially for such a young team. But I just felt like game one, realistically, not, not barely any playoff experience on their side. It was bound to be a little bit shaky. Um, credit or good for them that they're actually going up against the Pelicans team with no Zion because mm-hmm. that's why a lot of people were saying beforehand, like before the playoffs started and before the seeds was kind of locked up, like if you're an older like Lakers team or at that time Warriors team, maybe you want to play a young and experienced OKC team. Not saying you're going to lose the playing game like some people were saying, but if this if it fell that way, like that how it right. shaked out, like you would not be upset. Um so at least this way they can get a little bit more experience because obviously I think they're going to win this series for sure, especially with, like with no Zion. Um, but hopefully that can get them more comfortable, more comfortable in these moments, get at least a little bit more experience leading into the next series. But they still showed – they showed, especially for such a young team, I feel like they showed uh, showed good signs for me. Yeah, they were very resilient, which I think was the biggest right. thing because they knew going in and it's been their, their – how they've played all year, you know, they get – bullied inside at times they're not a huge team um they can get dominated on the glass i think uh valentunas had 13 and 20 rebounds in this one um but they just continue to work they're phenomenal rotating for one another um and they continue shea continues really to make timely timely buckets for them down the stretch that's why he's a finalist for clutch player of the year uh officially announced by the nba i think over the weekend um this is going to be a, a, a fun series. I don't think it's going to go more than five, maybe six games, depending on Zion's health. Um, but I think this is good for the Thunder to get a matchup like this. Exactly. Um, where they can work against a team who's going to make them work. 
back. It's not going to be somebody that's going to – not that anybody in the West was going to be a you know, a team that was going to roll over against them. Uh, but this Pelicans team is scrappy, if nothing else, and have a lot of people who play with a lot of heart and a lot of pride. So <clears throat> like this for the Thunder, um, I think that wraps up all the series out West. Pivoting out East, we'll want to get a quick one out of the way. Celtics Heat, <laughs> beat down. It it was over down. at, I think it was 9-0. It was over. I think like, the Celtics started out 14 zip. Yeah, but it was over. It was over. Yeah, but I say 9-0 because that's when like they he called the timeout. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> it was over, bro. It was over. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. No Jimmy, big problems. Huge With problem. Jimmy, I about to say still problems. Still think would have been big problems. <laughs> but this this heat half court offense abysmal. It's abysmal. It's bad. It's not good. They in both of their playing games. Uh, lost the first one, but were even in it because of how ridiculously good their defense and their zone was. Um, and then obviously in their second playing game against Chicago, they just, I mean, like suffocated the Bulls on the defensive side of the ball. You're not going to be able to do that against Boston. Uh, Boston rolls in this one. They were up, they end up winning by um, 20. They were up, I think, by 30 multiple different points in this game. It was not really close at all at any point. I don't expect this series to go more than four games, really. Like I think this is Big probably game, but... this is probably going to be the only sweep in the first round on either side. And it's uh, – if you're Miami, what are you going to do? This Celtics team is literally a juggernaut, bro. You don't have the tools offensively to keep up. I don't care how phenomenal your defense is. The offense is just – it's literally at times sometimes it's like, here, Tyler Hero, please save us. Please hit a shot, Tyler. Yeah. So I, it, it's not going to work. It's not going to work here. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, not not even a ton to, to say on it. Quick, they're cooked, bro. They're there. cooked. <laughs> they're just as simple as that, bro. They're cooked, bro. I would say I at least give them credit because they in the offseason they tried to add more offense, uh, offensive firepower when they tried to be in the Damian Lillard sweepstakes. You clearly, we see that they need it, but uh, yeah, they're cooked, bro. Yeah, uh, another young team here. The Orlando Magic dropped their first game against Cleveland. Uh, they're actually tipped off now for game two right now. Um, but yeah, they dropped their first one by 14 points to Cleveland. Not too surprised. I personally, and I still feel this way, picked the Magic in six games in this series. Um, I still believe in the magic. Look, this is a lot of, if not most of the players on this roster, this is their first playoff experience, right? Like give them a little bit of slack. I saw people coming at Paolo for going nine for 17 from the field, 24, seven and five. Granted, he did have nine turnovers, but like, that's not, there's, I promise you there's been worse playoff debuts. hundred percent. Um, but as a whole, really from the start in this one, Donovan Mitchell got going early. He was hot. Evan Mobley was stretching the floor. He shot 50% from three in this one, which was huge for him. People have been going at him because they feel like his offense hasn't caught up to where they thought it would be at this point. So it was good to see him knock down some big shots uh, for them. In this one, Max Struess, I think, had an early three, and I don't know if he even had another one that game. But just the Cavs got out to a really, really quick start. The arena got rocking. The Magic feel like they, it took too long for them to really settle in. Um, and they just made a lot of careless turnovers at times and never really had a chance to to catch back up and, and really ever get back into control in this one. I think tonight is going to be a different story. I think this series is going to be a different story. I still think that the Magic's defense is really going to be able to lock in. Jonathan Isaac is – he is one of the most impressive defenders to watch in the NBA. When he really locks in, he can put – people in a straight jacket um so i think they'll probably take turns throwing him and Suggs at donovan mitchell and trying to do whatever they can to make him uncomfortable which you're not gonna be able to ice a guy like donovan out but um you're gonna be able to, to to take their best shot at it i'm still confident that the magic will be able to to uh to get it done in this series but um again they dropped the first one to cleveland so hats off to them and hats off to donovan mitchell who 
continues to be a, a big time playoff performer in this league. Yeah, um, I actually was at work when this game was on, so I only got to catch bits and pieces of it. Um, for the little bit that I did see, it just to me, I'm like I said, I'm not really too surprised. Like, it's a, all of these young teams that either come out and play bad or just come out and just especially on the road that drop a game, like, it's not too, too surprising. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that to me, I think that's the biggest thing. The, the inexperience, um, the carelessness at times. Obviously, you're going up against a team in Cleveland who doesn't have a ton of playoff experience, but you got a, a guy like Donovan Mitchell who's been there, at least I want to say. He's been in definitely big games before. He's been in some mm -hmm. somewhat deep runs before as well, um, especially when you're on the road. I don't expect a, a Mavericks team to win that type of game. Hopefully, you just expect them to bounce back and then play a little bit better come tonight. But to me, I think – Predicting this series was tough. I want to lean Cavs because I'm a Donovan Mitchell guy. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Donovan Mitchell is a top-tier playoff riser. I do believe that. Mix that in with the inexperience from the Magic. Mm, it's tough. I think this. I honestly think this series goes seven. Um, and if I had to lean one way, obviously it's going to sound like of easy because they already got a game, but I'll, right. pick, I'll pick the Cavs. But even then, honestly, though, them winning one game at home shouldn't change your prediction of this series whatsoever. So right. I, th I think I'd lean the Cavs just because I'm a, I got to stick with my guy, Donovan Mitchell. I can't I can't pick against my guy, but I can That's see fair. a world That's where fair. I can see a world where the Magic defense locks in. I can see a world where um they play better, obviously, especially getting the game under their belt and they're a little bit more experienced. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the biggest thing to me is dropping one on the road does not. It shouldn't sway your opinion one way or another. But I, so I can see a world where they definitely step up. The defense locks in a little bit more. And like I said, you're never going to stop Donovan Mitchell, but you have pl a plenty of defenders who can at least make it a little bit tough. Um, and then they get going and win a couple games that way. So I can see a world where they, you know, definitely win this series for sure. Yeah, I, that's the series where I think is, is going to be exciting to watch the back and forth, uh, especially with, the Magic's defense, I think that they, they're just going to be able to be so creative and just the effort that they have out of some of their top perimeter defenders is going to make it fun to just watch them work. So they're going to make Donovan Mitchell work for every single bucket that he's going to get in the series. So, I, look, I, I definitely think that the Cavs can't win this series. I picked the Magic before the, the series even started. I'm going to keep rolling with my picks. I'm not going to switch anything. It's like you said, game one. As the home team, you should be expected to win. They always say that a series doesn't start until a road team snags a win. So, um, you know, we're going to see kind of how it continues to play out there. So what happens in, in sweeps then? Like, oh, no, technically, no. Oh, no, so what happens in, like, no, game sevens? What happens in, like, game seven, the home team wins? The series never starts? I'm just saying that. I, guess, that's how people, I think that's you got to throw it out the window at that point. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> what if the home team wins every game? The series just don't count? I, I get what you I mean. No, <laughs> uh, a team that I am, uh, I'm disappointed in, Indiana. <laughs> Damian Lillard scored zero points in the second half, and you would think, man, he must have really like put the clamps on him. If only he hadn't scored thirty five in the first half, <laughs> and is out here Dame time into the whole crowd in Milwaukee. He turned to the fans talking about this, what y'all brought me here for. And that is what they brought him here for. No yeah. Giannis, game one of the opening playoff series in the Eastern Conference for a team that has title aspirations, and Damian Lillard delivered for them. 109-94 to 94 win for Milwaukee. Um, they really just steamrolled <laughs> Indiana in this one. Uh, their defense is from the get-go – was smothering. I think that Tyrese Halliburton needs to be far more aggressive. Seven shots, seven shots is not going to do it, bro. Like right. you are one of the guys. Seven shots is not going to do it. I don't care if you shot four for seven and was efficient. You have to get more involved from a scoring perspective. Aaron Neesmith had a rough day shooting it from three point line. So did Miles Turner. Siakam was able to get in 36 points and 13 rebounds, but it just – it's not enough. You're going to need Tyrese Halliburton to step up and push that closer to 20 points a night in this series with the the type of assist numbers that he's been producing all season. Um, but, again, for going into this series um, without 
Giannis for at least the first game, same way that we, you know, talked about the Mavericks. Am I surprised that the Pacers lost this game? Not necessarily. I'm more so surprised in the fashion that it happened to go into this game without Giannis and to really just never be in a position to come close to winning it is a little bit concerning. I will say, let me double check because I don't want to cap. Let's see if I can remember how many games I had it in. Um, I picked the Pacers in seven games to win the series because I really didn't believe much in the Bucs without Giannis, especially if he's missing two, three games potentially of the series. For them to lose this first one, again, I'm not – I'm not, I'm letting you all know the listeners and the viewers. I did pick the Pacers. <laughs> right now, if I picked again, I would pick Milwaukee. <laughs> <because> Bro. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, finish, finish. Right. Just because I, I I was fairly confident that this Pacers team would be in a better spot with no Giannis. But if this is how y'all gonna perform with no Giannis, man, y'all don't got a chance when he comes back, bro. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll take my L there. I did pick the Pacers in seven. I I don't I don't see it no more, bro. I'm very disappointed how it came out yesterday. Bro, I the the funniest thing about this podcast sometimes is the fact that we don't really talk basketball that much outside of the podcast because I feel like we save a lot of our opinions for the podcast. Yeah. Um, like we might just send a text here and there. Like I sent you the Dame time thing here and there, but that's honestly just because yeah. Dame's one of my favorite players. He was just going crazy, but. I just think it's, I say that to say that it's so funny because I felt the exact same. I picked the Pacers to win the series too. I thought they was gonna win yeah. with no Giannis. Even if Giannis missed a few games, I'm like, bro, the Pacers have their number. Um, the Bucks can't guard they, who they can't guard against, especially you know elite guards. I'm thinking Tyrese Halliburton's gonna have a field day. I'm watching Dame Lillard score 35 points in the first half. I was like, am I dumb? I was like, I was like, <laughs> right. I was like bro, what am I doing, bro? What? Of course, it's the bu- it's Dame. And Jan's gonna come back eventually. I just talked myself into rethinking my pick, which I'm just like, I can't go back now. I, I can't. I gotta ride with this pick. Yeah. So that, I thought we gotta hold the L. But yeah, yeah, that, that that one was tough though. But it is what it is, man. Like I said, it's still plenty of time. But it is the like same exact thing with the math. It's like, bro, the fact that you came out here and and got handled like that. The granted, like if you lost, cool, fine. But it's like you know, it's no Giannis. You feel like you should, you know come out a little bit more fired up a little more ready to go yeah but it was it was a tough one i'm not gonna lie this this was the only like oh like game one that made me like reconsider my pick all everyone else i'm like it's fine it's game one this one though something about it i was just like i don't, I don't know this pick might be cooked bro it might be right Dam- damian lillard was getting whatever he wanted in the first half right whatever he wanted and so if he's getting his stuff off, Brooke is going to do Brooke stuff. Chris Middleton had himself a very nice game, which is – he ended up with a double-double two, which has been good because – and if he start to come online and Giannis can make sure that the calf situation is healed and healthy, like that is a Bucks team, which essentially at its core, like this is a lot of the guys who were on that – championship roster swap out drew holiday for damian lillard and I mean, these guys have the in their dna the championship dna like mm-hmm. uh so yeah I'm, rick carlisle bro figure it out get in tyrese's ear seven shots i ain't gonna cut it brother he has to be way more yeah he, that's the biggest thing too he has to be way more aggressive especially for a bucks team that can't guard nobody like, I, I get it. Y'all both can't guard nobody, but that means you should be at least going off as well. Yeah. They, they, he's got to figure something out. Got to figure something out. TJ McConnell also was super inefficient off the bench. This, they just had a really poor shooting game on top of the fact that they were getting torched on the opposite side of the ball. But I mean, honestly, sounds, it sounds a lot like the Mavericks game, <laughs> like similar to the storyline. I mean, I was going to say, I mean, besides the Ma- the Mavericks, they really don't have much of an excuse. Well, they don't have any excuse. But, like, I mean, we've seen kind of a re- reoccurring theme with a lot of these games. It's, you know, the young, kind of inexperienced teams coming out kind of flat. You know what I mean? Teams that don't have a ton of playoff experience. Even the teams that won, like, in, like, an OKC, it's just you still, like, a little bit shaky. 
Um, yeah, just a lot of these teams that don't have the huge playoff experience, they're, they're going to come out more flat than a team that at least has been there at least a little bit. You know what I mean? So, like I said, you can't fully count out anyone off of game ones, but I will say this one was just it's a little bit shaky for my pick. Yeah, for sure. Um, Jalen Suggs just went down and I, is holding I, his knee. I'm literally watching it as we speak. That stuff. Ooh, I didn't see him. it. Ooh. No, it's not good. I haven't seen the clip yet. I just seen the clip. It, it looks more like a, a hyperextension, but it, uh-huh. anything with, to me, anything with a knee, I don't know what it could be because it could be. I seen Kawhi get bumped and tear his whole what ACL, where he looked like barely got bumped by Joe Ingles and like his whole knee was done. So I don't know when it comes to knee injuries, bro. Well, hopefully that is not anything too serious. But they said that he was not putting weight on his leg, so hopefully it's not anything too crazy. Because man, they, Suggs has been huge for Orlando this mm-hmm. season, and he's huge in this series. But I'm looking at it right now. Donovan Mitchell already has 12. Cleveland's 18 points as well. Like he's just maybe maybe Orlando doesn't won't have the answers for him. Um, hey, you never know. Yeah. The last series that we haven't touched on is quietly probably my second favorite series to have shaken out with the seating, and that is. Knicks, 76ers, obviously the Sixers beat Miami to get and lock up the seven seed. And uh, Josh Hart, how about Josh Hart? The go 20, 22 points, four of eight from threes. A wild-looking clutch three-pointer down the stretch in this one. Um, this is going to be, if Joel Embiid can stay healthy, this is going to be a dog fight series any team we knew that was going to play a healthy 76ers team was going to be a dog fight because joel makes it so difficult um and he did typical joel stuff ended up getting 11 out of 12 from the free throw line he still doesn't look himself He's not you can tell that the right the bounce is not there the explosiveness is not the explosiveness is not there the conditioning is not there you can see that he's mm-hmm hunched over a ton throughout the game, even early on in his first stints. Um, but Tyrese Maxey was incredible in this one, 33 points. Um, Jalen Brunson struggled a lot from the field. And again, they are sending a lot of bodies at him. Kyle Lowry is a veteran guy. He's going to be scrappy. So he's making it difficult for Jalen, um, as well as guys like Nick Batum coming off the bench um, and in Kelly Oubre as well. And then obviously you have Embiid who, for as much as he struggled at times on the offensive side of the ball, just not looking like himself, defensively his impact is, I mean, this is a completely different 76ers defense when he's on the court. His rim to Torrance is noticeable, very, very noticeable when he's on the floor. Uh, but this Knicks team, this the role players around Jalen Brunson, again, particularly Josh Hart and Deuce McBride, stepped up big, big time in this one. That Deuce McBride contract, I don't know if you've seen it, he's making like, Three or four million dollars a year for like the next three years. I didn't know that. That's crazy. Deal. Absolute steal. one of the best value contracts in the NBA. Easily one of the best value contracts in the NBA right now. Um, but 111 to 104. The Knicks take the game one in MSG. How are you feeling in this one? I think I ended up taking the Knicks in six games. Again, I wasn't too sure what Joel Embiid's availability would be coming out of that, that game against Miami. So I was anticipating he might miss some time. Um, But even with him healthy, just playing the way that he is, unfortunately, I I don't see a way that the 76ers can get out of this series. They they need him to be that guy. And I just don't know right now if his his body is going to allow that. Yeah. The biggest thing for me was um, one, like especially early and pretty much throughout the whole game, them making Jalen Brunson very, very uncomfortable. Uh, You talked about Kyle Lowry being very scrappy. Kelly Olenek, not Olenek, Kelly Oubre (laughs) playing, Mm -hmm. playing fantastic defense. Um, uh, they, they they really just made him uncomfortable. Every shot I felt like was very contested. Um, he didn't really get a lot of open space for most of the game, which was honestly the best thing you can do to try to beat the next team is have Jalen Brunson not go off on you. But 
the way the Knicks play, it's like they're so scrappy and they're just such a Tibbs team that like they're going to fight and claw no matter what. Like you see, and they're flying in for offensive rebounds. It's like they're doing every anything possible to stay in the game. And you kind of felt that for them, especially when they knew like their best player didn't have the greatest of shooting games. Um, you talked about it. Deuce McBride came in and hit huge shot. Josh Hart was already impacting the game in a bunch of different ways. And then like, Later into the game, hit a ridiculous three. I hit a couple threes, honestly, I want to say, especially in the fourth quarter. So he stepped up big. Um, the biggest thing for me, I feel like it's so tough having Joel Embiid hurt because, honestly, as I'm watching the game and I'm just watching, you know, the others for the 76ers, the role players, Kyle Lowry, who has playoff experience, step up. Mm-hmm. Okay, Lenny playing great on defense. Max, who I already believed in before this series or before these playoffs started as a guy who I can, I think I can count on Ty- Tyrese Maxey to not, you know, kind of fold under these lights. Um, and he stepped up big. No, nobody, side note, you cannot stay in front of him, bro. He's just too quick, bro. Like, he's, no, he's just way his, too fast. His, like, gear shift to go from stop, start, it's insane, it, it might bro. be top top three in the NBA right now. It's ridiculous Facts. how how fast this first step is. Facts, but um, well, I'm watching all that. And I'm just thinking honestly because I picked the Knicks to win this series. I actually didn't put in how many games. Low key a cop out because same thing for you for that you said. I don't know if Joel Embiid was playing, missing game. I just didn't know, so I was just like, I think the Knicks are gonna win. The games are dependent on Joel Embiid's health, but I feel like this really could have been the year that they really could have made some noise in the 76ers. If Joel Embiid is fully healthy, because Mm -hmm. this year, different than others, I like the others that they have on the team, especially for the playoffs. Like, I don't think Kyle Lowry at this point in his career is the greatest of players, but Kyle Lowry on your playoff team, those are the type type of guys you need. (laughs) Those two, three charges he's going to take, that'll swing a game. That'll swing a whole game, bro. That will swing a series. (laughs) You know what I mean? That will swing an entire series. Those mm-hmm. charges, he always is the type of guy I feel like that he just hits timely shots or like yeah. gets a steal when you need him to, gets a weird looking layup that he makes it. Like, bro, he's like for the playoffs, he's a, definitely a rotational guy that you want to have. Um, and just like all the others that they do have on this team, I truly feel like with jo- Joel Embiid healthy at 100% playing at the, that MVP level that he was playing at before he got hurt, I think that this really could have been the year where. I definitely would have picked him to make it past the second round this year for sure. If everything stayed as when it was in the beginning of the year. Um, but I truly feel like they really could have made some noise this year. And if he was fully healthy, I think they'd win this series, but it's yeah. just unfortunate. Like he's just, you see, he's out there. He's I'd say at least at best 75%, maybe like yeah. at best. Yeah. Cause right now he's really, you could see he's on the perimeter a lot. He's taking more threes because he can't, really do the same things that he that he used to be able to do. He doesn't seem like he really trusts that knee. Um, mm-hmm. And you've seen it the one time where he made the crazy off the glass highlight dunk, yeah. he hurt his knee or he at least knee, like – Knee buckled. It buckled, yeah. yeah. Like he, you know, got scared for a little bit. Like I don't I, – the biggest thing for me is I think it's mental. I don't think he fully trusts that knee. Um, right. I can't really blame him. You know what I'm saying? You know, he's like a seven-foot, 300-pound dude, like coming down hard on that knee. Like I wouldn't trust it either. But – yeah, man, he's just not not the Joel Embiid, the MVP level Joel Embiid that they would need for them to win this series, unfortunately. Yeah, his his body is like it's his biggest his biggest rival, biggest yeah. enemy at this point. He his his knees, his feet have robbed him of a lot in his NBA career. He just can never seem to stay healthy. I think his foot kept him out of his first two seasons in the NBA. Was finally able to get healthy, and now he's he's really been plagued by knee injuries the last couple of years, especially once we get to the postseason. And it's unfortunate because I, I think, like you said, and I think you even might have mentioned it last podcast, like early in the year, it felt like the MVP was his to lose. Like he looked like he was on it was a, locked up, right? A path to becoming a back to back MVP. He was scoring better than he did last year when he led the league in scoring and had grown as a playmaker on top of being the, the defensive anchor for this team. Like he just does so much when he's healthy <clears throat> and he looked like the Robin, best player on the planet before he got he, hurt. He was putting himself in that conversation, which is not easy to do with how well Jokic has been, been playing the last couple of years. Um, 
So yeah, it, it's unfortunate. I don't see a, a way unless he can, you know, miraculously get healthy by game three or four. But yeah, they, they need him to be a guy that I just think his body is not going to allow him to be in this series, which sucks. It sucks for Philly fans because they're being robbed of it. But it's tough. It's tough. That's uh, that's why people say, man. Sometimes your best of uh, your best ability is availability, and he ain't really been super available the last couple of playoffs. Not saying that it's his fault, but he just can't stay healthy. Yeah, it's unfortunate, man. It's definitely unfortunate. So, like I said, I just I haven't always been a guy who kind of believed in the Sixers going into the playoffs because you know, like I said, they're known for literally folding, especially when you get to the second round. But I truly feel like this year. If he was to be healthy, like he definitely could have been, definitely would have been a different story for him. So, but I guess you know, hopefully, uh, he can. We can at least get one healthy Joel Embiid playoff run to really see what it's like. Um, at like you know at full strength, but who knows yeah. at this point? Yeah, it's it's tough, man. It's tough. Um, briefly before we we kind of get towards the the very end of the episode. I do want to touch on the teams who are out of the playing. Um, I want to first start with Chicago because I think it's the most cut and dry. Uh, build around Kobe White, please, first of all. <laughs> 40, 40, 40 ball in the first plane. I know that's not going to count in any record book for him. Since that's crazy. Game. I forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> that's playing wild. is that weird. It's not a regular season game. But it's, it's not a playoff game. game. It's like the end season care. tournament championship. Could not us not a soul on that Atlanta Hawks team guard Kobe White. He was getting wherever and whatever he wanted. They have really found. So I don't know what the heck Kobe White did this offseason. My credit to him, bro. It that game confirmed even more why he was my pick for most improved player of the year. He is just he on a on a on the court with DeMar DeRozan was far and away the best player for the Chicago Bulls that night. Mm-hmm. Um, and so so credit to him, but obviously they lose the next one to Miami. We've talked about it a ton, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but big, big changes need to happen in Chicago. Big, big changes. I do want to focus on the team that they beat first in the plan, which is Atlanta. And I want to start by asking you, if you are the Atlanta Hawks, what – is your process and plan going into next season, knowing that you were the the 10 seed and you got bounced out in the first playing game by a bad and hurt Bulls team? To me personally, you can do one of two things. You can do the contending route, which is you trade one of DeJounte Murray or Trey Young for another like player in return or maybe some pieces, however that works. Don't just do straight up picks and tank because if you're going to tank, you do the other route, which is trade them both. Mm-hmm. And you just get young players, picks, assets, things of that nature, and just kind of rebuild fully from there. Um, which way is the better way? Depends on the offers that you get from either Trey Young or DeJounte Murray. Um, if it were me, see, to me it's tough because I'm not a fan of, I think that you trade either one, you're still not – they're never going to have a roster that's going to be good enough to win your championship. I've never yeah. been a fan of just being good enough to be a, what, six, five, maybe five seed and get bounced in round one, maybe two. That's never been, like, the way I like to build any sort of team. I'm Listen, this is either we're contending or we're building something that can get you to that point. I hate being in the middle. So, yeah. to me, it's a little bit tough. I might lean the tear down way, but then again, you can also say that look, not too too long ago, we were in the Eastern Conference Finals with a Trey Young led team, so it's not impossible. And you guys are in the East; it's not like you're in a super the tough West uh, Western Conference. So either way, I see sides of it. Um, I might lean the tear down way, but honestly, at this point, who really knows? I don't, and I don't know what their uh, their draft like capital looks like off the top of my head to know if that's even a smart option for them. Um, Cause I don't know what their whole situation is. That also is a factor that plays into it. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll be honest. 
I, I've been on the record on this podcast saying that I was I was holding out optimism that DeJounte Murray and Trey Young would be able to play together. There were some flashes early in this season with Trey Young being off the ball that looked a lot better than last year. It's not going to work, bro. I, that ship mm-hmm. has sailed in my book. I for a couple of different reasons, but obviously the biggest one is just Trey Young is not it. He he's he can't play off the ball. Nope. Point blank. I, and it's I shouldn't even say can't because anybody can. Like it's a it's a want to thing, mm-hmm. right? Like you have to want to be mentally locked in and a threat off the ball. Steph Curry is dominant with or without the ball in his hands. I'm not saying that Trey Young has to be Steph Curry, but I'm just saying you got to be more than just sitting at the hash mark like this is fucking pro bro. Like <laughs> there's got to be more to your game when you don't have the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, on top of the fact that – and look, he, he was hurt. You know, he had the – the was it his thumb that he broke? Mm-hmm. He had surgery on in his, his non-dominant hand. He uh, didn't have a great shooting performance in this one. That's that's one thing. Defensively this year, Trey has been better. But, man, it's just so frustrating to watch him play defense sometimes. It's like the effort is like – where the effort and the decision-making is like, bro, what are you doing? And then that the possession and the first half in that game where he he comes up and bites, tries to, you know, plays a risky passing lane. Uh, I think he runs past like Wesley Matthews or something. They end up getting an open three because of it. Then comes down with the time running out at halftime, is doing a bunch of drill moves and tries to throw a behind the back pass to DeJounte Murray, who might have had a shot if you would have thrown a normal, simple pass, but you want to do a behind the back pass. He got to jump all over here to get it. The defense rotates. He can't get a shot up. And now DeJounte Murray is heated because you done gave up three points and then might have just taken away three points because you're doing all this extra stuff, bro. I I am I, I'm in a tough spot with Trey Young. I was a believer for a long time. He's starting to piss me off. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just the the lack of growth in the areas that it's needed, it, it has to happen. It has to have happened. It has to have happened by now. Mm-hmm. So to be honest with you, like if I'm Landry Fields, I'm, I'm the Hawks GM, if I'm in that front office, if the right call comes across my desk for Trey Young, I'm probably pulling the trigger on it. Same thing if it comes across my desk for DeJounte Murray. It's just, uh, it's frustrating at times. And and when I say the right call, I'm not trading Trey Young for nothing less than, I'm talking a lot of first round picks, some young talent. Like it's really got to be a, like we're setting us up for some real success here in a couple of years. Right. Not just cause. I I still think Trey Young is a high quality NBA player. I'm not a hundred percent sold anymore. If he can be, he can be that guy on the team. I think he could be a high, high, high value second option. Um, so if you keep him and you you're able to you know move off of Dejounte and make some stuff work on the cap and kind of retool, cool. But they need to operate moving forward. That they need to find a guy, and they need to figure out a way to get him to sort himself out on when he doesn't have the ball in his hands because it's. It's unacceptable at this point that if somebody of his skill set and just how good he can be, and we've seen the blueprint from other players around the league, you can't be, you cannot be that uninvolved off the ball. And I, I think Dejounte Murray did a lot to his game to try to make it work, and I feel like the same was not reciprocated with Trey Young. Yeah. So that's my mini rant on Atlanta because that just that game and especially like how Trey Young played in that one particularly like aside like take the bad shooting night out of it because like I said he had the the hand injury just it's those little things that irk me sometimes watching him and it, it doesn't need to be that way. 
trade Trey Young to the Spurs. I actually just saw a report today that the Spurs don't want him. They don't I do don't blame them, <laughs> but still, <laughs> I, don't blame them either, right? I don't blame them. But all right, get a, get a good point guard, please. Get something, yeah. something, please. But um, that is funny. Yeah, pivoting to the West, though, we'll start with Sacramento. Obviously, they lose to a Zion William List Pelicans team. They get bounced out in the second playing game. Uh, they have some uh, some real questions there, starting with the fact that this is now the second year in a row where I think Sabonis is play in the, the play-in tournament this year, but the playoffs last year was a big detriment to their overall results. Um, he just doesn't offer a lot of the things that – and you look at any of the top teams in the league, they have a center who can – be a rim protector. A lot of them, if they aren't rim protectors, they can space the floor. Some of them do both. Like those are the two biggest glaring holes that Sabonis lacks. Mm. Um, so now they're here after one year after being the three seed out west, bounced out, don't make the playoffs. Um, and Malik Monk, De'Aaron Fox had a press conference where it, it basically sounded like he doesn't even think Malik Monk is going to come back. I don't think they can offer him as much as other teams can and the way he's been playing, someone's going to give that man a bag and he deserves it. He definitely does. Um, so I, I don't know. What do you think about Sacramento? Really? What do you think about Sabonis being your starting center? Like, is that something that can work? Cause those questions came up last year. I thought it was a little bit hasty, but two seasons now, you know, what is the quote? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Like, Mm -hmm. it's hard to fight against the sample size. So how how you feel about Sabonis' fit in Sacramento? I just think it's tough. I just think that his game limits you come playoff time. Like you said, not mm -hmm. being a rim protector, but also not spacing the floor. It's like it's so easy for teams to kind of game plan against you and, you know, use your weaknesses to their advantage. And I think come playoff time, you're, you're, you're just – you're not a full-on liability, but, like, it's so easy for them to, to scheme you out of the game or at least like it, it, it's just tough. It's just tough. Like you've seen it with Golden State um, with like was last year where it just seemed like, bro, Sabonis is not helping anything on the court right now. Like they're just sagging off and they're letting you shoot and you're you not shooting or you not being able to shoot is actively hurting this this team right now. And then on defense, you're not you're not giving me nothing. So it's it's tough. Um because, like I said, to me, it's it's really come playoff time. And honestly, that's really what matters because you can have the best regular season in the world. If come playoff time, you're somewhat of a liability. Like, none of that stuff matters in the regular season. Whether you and Fox get a, or play along well together in the regular season, if it can't work come playoff time, it just, it, it's not – you got to go. Honestly, you got to go. I'm not saying you just, at, you just flat out trade them, but – it's on the board, I'd say, because obviously if you're picking between the two, obviously you're definitely building around Fox if you're picking between right. the two of them for sure. Um, so uh, to me, it's definitely on the board because I granted the Kings have been an organization that's been bad for so long. Any little success to them is like, OK, we're building something. It's good. Like it'd be hard to kind of veer away from that, even especially if it's a little bit risky. But if you really want to win, like if you are just tired of this, like, okay, yeah, like we don't suck anymore. Like we made the playoffs. Okay, yeah, we don't suck anymore. Like we're kind of relevant now. Like if you really want to win, you might have to make that call. Yeah. And uh, it's tough because I, they, they, there's young pieces there to be excited about. Keon Ellis was phenomenal in their game against Golden State. Um, defensively, he is – and he's top tier. He's a guy that might genuinely make all defensive teams with the opportunity. And then his offense in that game was huge for them as well. He's he's on a super small contract for the next couple of years. Keegan Murray was huge in that game. He's been huge the last two seasons. His shot making continues to improve. Um, and then when he gets hot from the three point line, um, he can you know shoot it like up there with the best of them in the, the NBA. So there's there's pieces here. Mm -hmm. But like you said, they they're going to have to make a decision with Sabonis long-term because it does feel like they've kind of capped where they can can really go as a team 
with this current construction. So it's going to be a very, very interesting offseason for them. But no offseason is going to be more interesting <laughs> than the one in Golden State. Flat out, they got Molly Wap in that first playing game against Sacramento. Uh, and they're now in a position where Clay Thompson is a free agent. Gary Payton has a player option. Uh, Dario Saric is a free agent. And Chris Paul's salary is non-guaranteed, so they can't cut him for basically no, pon- no penalty. And uh, this team doesn't own their first-round pick this year. So there's not a ton of obvious avenues for them to get better. So I'm going to pose the question to you. If you're the Warriors GM, if you are Mike Dunleavy, Clay Thompson comes and sits down in your office. If he wants $25 million a year, pick up the mic for Clay, <laughs> Clay Thompson, right? He wants what a, a max contract for him would probably be like in the 40s or something like that. Let's say Clay comes in and he said, I'm going to take a pay cut. 20 27 million dollars a year. That's what he wants. 27 M's. I'm Clay Thompson, bro. I've been with the Golden State Warriors from the get-go. Me, I Steph, know. and Draymond. This is the, the original uh, man. He just wants 27 brothers. M's. Are yep. you giving Clay Thompson 27 million dollars a year? Get ready to learn Chinese, buddy. Yeah. You're cooked. <laughs> You're cooked, bro. <laughs> You're out of there, buddy. That's not happening. Not in this organization. That's not Yo, happening, bro. <laughs> that video where he on the phone. <laughs> Ni hao. <laughs> <laughs> Every bro. time I see that one, cracks me up, bro. Get ready to learn Chinese, buddy, because you're out of here. I'm telling you that right now. 27 M's, not around what, here, bro. What 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 contract value do you think seems fair for Clay right $10 million. now to stay in Golden State? Ten. That's less than a mid. You just shot over for ten in the playoffs and scored a donut, bro. Not even the playoffs in the play in and scored donut, bro. You're yeah. done. There's no like, bro. He's he's absolutely cooked. He's absolutely washed. And I feel bad because I think Clay is a good, is a nice guy. You know, part of the dynasty. You know, obviously was huge to them winning championships. Like his impact cannot be um understated. Like, his impact was huge. He was very, very important to the dynasty. And none of this should – anything that happens from either, like, when he was bad to anything after this should take away from anything that he did, like, to win them championships. But with that being said, you're cooked, bro. Like, we're not done. You can go. I'm sorry. You're you're fine. Your services are no longer needed here. So I don't think he's bringing anything – a value at this point. He's not the defender he used to be. Granted, like obviously the injuries were the big factor in that. That's not completely his fault. But if you tell me you're gonna go over 10 in the play in, bro. What are you doing on this court right now, bro? What are you what are you doing on this court? And your shots like because you're still shooting as if you're the old clay. You know what I'm saying mm-hmm. you're still shooting the same shots as if you know you're the old clay. So you're bringing me nothing of value, and it's just Honestly, it's how stuff works. It's that's that's how dynasties and stuff works. Like, what's a? I mean, I shouldn't say that because there's been some dynasties like Jordan's Bulls. Jordan retired after a championship. Um, what was another one? I can't remember off the top of my head. But a lot of, honestly, some dynasties end like on top a little bit. But mm-hmm. if you just kind of try to keep it going and going and going and going, eventually, like it's, it's gonna it run out. out. Yeah. So, to me, if I'm the Warriors, Clay's not gonna be back here next year. Do I, I? I don't know a way that they, because you st- you still want to maximize Steph, right? You still right. obviously Steph wants to win. He literally said it. he's like, I just he's he asked about Draymond and Clay coming back. He's like I just want to win, which means point back. That, that, that's as clear, right? That's as clear as a message if I've seen Steph send to the front office of like, I don't care what y'all got to do, fix this, bro. Facts. Fix this. Yeah. I need help because. Selfishly, obviously, I want Steph to, you know, say explore his other options. But yeah. <laughs> realistically, and especially if I am Steph or a basketball fan, you want to see Steph end his end his uh his career in Golden State. Like you just, you, yeah. I just, I feel like that'd only be right. Right. But uh, realistically, if you want to still build a contender, besides like the 
one-off miracle chance of like a superstar disgruntled, I want to specifically go to the Warriors type of thing, you're not realistically building a, a championship roster. Next season, I don't I don't see it happen because I don't see a clear way that it happened. I'll if Kaminga oh. takes a superstar leap. You could bring Draymond Bra- back. He still holds down the defense. He still anchors the well, defense. He's locked up. He's on. He signed an yeah. extension already. Oh, he, oh, yeah, he did. He did. So, yeah, Draymond. And I'm fine with that. Like, Draymond still, when he's on the court, Draymond is fine. You know what I'm saying? He yeah. the, he's back. He the, was just keeping his hands to himself. <laughs> that, that's fact. When he's not, like, actively trying to murder someone on the court, like, he's fine. <laughs> Basketball-wise, Draymond is still bringing you tons of value on the court. Um, You need to get size. You guys are way too small. But either way, like I said, I just I don't see a world with their their championship level team. It's next year specifically. I just don't see it, see that happening. But Clay, regardless, you're not back here, buddy. I'm sorry, you're out of there. Yep. Yeah, uh, and I just double checked it. His max contract the Warriors can offer him is a four year, two hundred twenty one million dollar <laughs> extension. So that would be that would be fifty five million dollars a year, buddy. Uh, you might not get fifty five dollars from me, bro. That's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's not happening, bro. Whatsoever. <laughs> um, Clay's already come out and said that he, or, or reports have come out and said that he would be willing to take less. To stay I, with bet. State. I, I bet. I sure hope so. And you, and um, everybody is always down to say that after they play trash. And then they put up a stinker. Hey, yo, by the way, I'll listen, I'll take the pay cut. Yeah, no, you at this point you have no choice but to take a pay yeah. cut if you want to come back. So don't try to put it out now, like to get out in front of it, like look, look at me, I'm being a team player. Cause if he dropped, if he was like he cause he was playing well, if he dropped 40 in this game and they lost, he was like, Look, I'm still, you know, I'm still clay. I still want my money. But now that he put up the stinker, I'll yeah. take the pay cut, guys. Come on, bro, <laughs> Um, yeah, so from what I've read, there's really three options. Obviously, they um, they bring him back on a short term deal or just one that's obviously much smaller than fifty five million dollars a year, something closer to the 20 ish range, I would imagine. Um, there's always the option for them to do a sign and trade. I that almost feel that would a I think you have to have Clay sign off on that and just B I can't imagine Golden State's fan base reacting to like them trading him like him leaving in free agency I already can't imagine but them trading him I will say though Warriors fans are absolutely done with Clay like if you hear Warriors fans talk about Clay at this point they all said the same thing they're like you know we love you what you did for us you blah 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 but at this point, present day, like, bye. Like, they're kind of done with him. So, I don't – to me – I've seen a mix, though. I've seen fans who are, like – they they don't – like, they just do not want to see him go, no matter the circumstances. But, obviously, that that goes back to him coming back on, like, a $20 million deal versus a $55 million deal. But if you ask those fans, like, all right, Clay – Actually, no, because he said he'll take the pay cut. Yeah, I know. I, I see what you're saying. You know, they that's just the fandom in you. Like, because yeah, don't get me wrong. If this everything was just great to where like they were still playing at a great level, obviously you don't you never want to break up that core. Like, right, you want them all to retire as warriors. But when it gets to a point where the play is is lessening, and but you're st- you still obviously Clay still wants to play. Like Clay, Clay doesn't want to retire. You got to make those tough decisions. It's if yeah. you guys still want to win. Because if, if Steph was like, because I put it this way, if Steph was, you know, washed or like not playing as great and the the choice, the choice was blow it all up, give it to everybody or just like let him ride it out. Like you just let him ride it out because you just keep them all as warriors. But it's like the problem is Steph is still here. Clay is like down here. So you kind of got to make tough decisions. The last thing I'll say about the Warriors is once again in this game, particularly against the Kings in the playing tournament. Steve Kerr, fraudulent coach time, once again, continues to just randomly have moments where I don't understand. He's not Clay Thompson, coach, bro. Clay Thompson is finished the game 0 for 10. He played 32 minutes. It was very evident early, did not have it going. And we've said multiple times, if you watch basketball, you can see 
if Clay Thompson doesn't have it going after these injuries, he's a liability. He's nice. not the same Clay. I this is a winner. This is game seven, winner go home environment. You lose your season is over. Why is Moses Moody playing less than half of the minutes? He played 15 minutes. He gave you 16 points. AirPods gave you 24 minutes. He went two for three, eight rebounds. Like the production is there from your younger guys. Like we got to pull clay at some point. We cannot live and die at, with him on the court right now in a winner go home scenario. Like you just cannot have that happen as Steve Kerr. But yet again, his rotations and why he does the things that he does, they continue to confuse me like they have all year. I can't believe he's the team USA coach. I think that's crazy. That's um, bro. To me, that's ridiculous. Like you have all the options in the entire league. You pick Steve Kerr, bro. I, I need to see something really quick. That's great. Like the other people like not like say yes to it. Like because if every if every coach is like yeah I'll do it and you pick Steve Kerr, that's ridiculous. Man, Spolstra and assistant. If y'all don't switch that right now, bro, we finna lose in the Olympics, dog. Bro, these dudes got, bro, oh my God, bro. That's, nah, bro. These dudes got Tom Brady backing up Mark Sanchez. What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, bro. That's, nah, that's crazy. Ty Lu is an assistant. Nah, bro. What are we doing here? I the, bro, I literally when I said every coach in the league, those two names was the main right. two I was talking about. <laughs> and there's assistants. Get out of here, bro. What are we doing? Yeah. Might as well have I, Darby Ham as the head coach. Go ahead. At this might point, as well. He just had his hand in his pocket saying, listen, show off the Spain got a good ball club, game. man. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> that's his main, that's all he do is credit to the other team. They got a good ball club. That's it. Yeah, I'm not going to go too much of the depth into it because I'm going a, I'm to a plug a video that I've been putting together. I'm going to deep dive into that game specifically and the Warriors offseason. So y'all stay tuned for that because Steve Kerr, I don't get it, bro. Sometimes, bro, it's literally like no thought sometimes. Um, The last thing I did want to do before we wrap up today Something a little bit different. We actually also have never done this before. But I want to go back in time. And I want to revisit draft comps for players. And I want to just see how it's panned out from when these guys were in the draft to where they are at in their career now. So I'm going to go through a draft. And I'm going to give you the draft comps that are here. And I want you to guess what player this is based on their draft comps. So let me give the little TikTok intro. Guess the NBA player by their draft comp. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give you the draft year that I'm working with first. So it gives you a little bit of parameters. Copy. So I'm going to give you, this is the 2019 draft. Shades of Charles Barkley, Blake Griffin, and Julius Randle. The 2019 draft. Charles, you said Charles Barkley. Who? Charles Barkley, Blake Griffin, Julius Randle. I can't. I'm blanking on who was in the 2019. Can you give me people who? Not the person. Obviously, this is this is the John ja Morant, RJ, Zion. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, bet, 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 bet. Okay, who was in that draft? That was Zion then. That was Zion. Okay, yeah, Charles, Charles Barkley. Yeah, that was Zion. Athletic. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Smaller, right. undersized. Next one. Shades of Paul George, Rashard Lewis, and bigger Ben McLemore. This is 2019? 2019. Top 10 pick. Shades of Paul George. Cam Reddish? Cam Reddish. That's a Crazy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's of Paul George. Okay. I mean, panned out, no, obviously, but like the body type. He, at that point, he was a scorer. Uh, I mean, 
That's like that's like his seal. Like there was like ceiling, Paul yeah. George. This is crazy. <laughs> this is actually disrespectful. Shades of the Morris twins, Jabari Parker, and it specifically says washed Carmelo Anthony. <laughs> washed Melo is nuts. <laughs> why, why would they say that? I don't know. That's why, would say, bro. why would they say washed Melo? That's nuts. 2019, I'm assuming still uh, R.J. Mm-hmm. Barrett? Not R.J. Barrett. Who else is in that draft class? Uh, camera. Oh, you should pull it up. Pull it up and look through right. the draft class and yeah. see. Actually, yeah, you're right. You're right. I don't know why I'm doing this off the dome. Like I'm supposed to. Let me see. 2019 NBA draft. Picks one through sixty. Okay, perfect. Um, say that the the <laughs> watch mellows. Is it Rui? Rui Hachimura. Why they didn't do my man's like that? Watch, watch the mellow. Watch that's mellow is crazy. Watch never, the mellow. You should never crazy. say that. I because <laughs> his game because he has like a mid range like post up. I see what they mean, but like that's so disrespectful, bro. Why would they do that to my man's, bro? That's crazy. Yeah, that's super, super, super foul, bro. <laughs> Same draft class, bro. Shades of Thrift Shop Nikola Jokic, Detlef Shrimp, and Drew Gooden. Thrift Shop Nikola Jokic. This, it, it, bro, who's is it? What is this the NBA? This is, this is Kevin O'Connor. Yes, bro. <laughs> bro what? Kevin O'Connor at the ringer. They doing some wild, wild draft comps. Thrift Shop Nikola Jokic. So I'm assuming this is a big man. It kind of, I'll give you a hint. This guy's been in the news. So, all right. What the comp, What are the comps again? Say it again. Thrift Shop, Nikola Jokic, and Detlef Shrimp, and Drew Gooden. <laughs> and this is a 2019 draft. 2019 draft. The only guy I can think of is P.J. Washington. Is that what they're talking about? No. It's... It's the better man himself, Jonte Porter. Thrift <laughs> shop, Nikola Jokic. That's that. Bro, that might be too much of a compliment at that point. I I did like I did hear he had a game out of high school, had injuries, but that's we, didn't even, we didn't even talk about Jonte Porter. But we did, not that's crazy. Twenty, yeah. you just threw away your whole NBA career for twenty bands, bro. It's just greed, man. Greed is. Greed is a powerful thing. It's an evil thing. Twenty. Sick. What's the extra twenty thousand gonna do for a millionaire? Literally. What like, is what, it bro? Do? Your check is more. Where the game check is worth more than that? Like what? Just put. What He's making about? minimum two way contract, making five hundred k. You just, just get better. Work in your game. Get yourself. Better. I would like if they would have came out and been like, "Yeah, Jonte Porter's been. He got found out for Ben, but he was Ben his overs." You know, like, I bet he's like, I respect yeah. that. He, he's betting the, uh, he's like, I stink. <laughs> we're we're right. playing the he under. Bet his under. He got three rebounds. It was like, uh, uh, my line was four and a half. Now nah, my eye hurt, bro. Take me <laughs> out the game. Bro, he, that's he was betting on the Raptors to lose while being on the Raptors. Personally, Personally, I felt like that should be like a ban for like his family too. So like any brothers, oh, siblings. MPJ should be out of there. Yeah, like he gotta go too, bro. Because like he, you telling me you're not talking about this with your NBA brother too? Come on, bro. That's investigation, yeah. bro. Where that investigation? Investigate, at? investigate the whole the family. Show, and then MPJ is definitely hitting the group chat. Murray, Yoke, and Nah, bro. Pack them up. They gotta go. <laughs> they gotta. They gotta go. Uh, let me go. Let's do one more draft class. Let's go to the 2021 draft class. Um, actually, wait, no. Which one? Anthony Edwards is 2020 draft, right? 2020, yep. Yeah, let's do the 2020 draft. Um, let me pull up the comparisons there. Let me see if I can find the ringers one again because they got some funny comps in there, bro. That is crazy. Um, watched Carmelo Anthony. It's nuts. It's like that's insanely disrespectful. 
Um, all right. So I am in the 2020 draft class. I'm going to scroll and find one that is a little funny here. Let me see. Let me see. I've <laughs> shades of Manu Ginobili and D'Angelo Russell. So a lefty, I'm assuming. I actually don't know what he is off the top of my head. Shades of Manu Ginobili and D'Angelo Russell in 2020. He is left-handed. I swear to God. If you're talking about who I think you're talking about, Billy, I swear to God. Killian Ooh. Hayes. <laughs> Killian you know Hayes. Know what the part is? It is Killian Look. Hayes. He was the number one rated person on his big board. Nah, bro. He's nuts. What is he seeing? I mean, don't get me wrong. It's tough because when you're about prospects, it's yeah. easy hindsight to be like, what were you right. saying? Because I guarantee, like, the dra- NFL draft is coming up in two days. There's probably some people we're looking out like, they're going to be nice. In five Not years, be like, out. what would y'all talk about? This guy was a bum. Mm-hmm. That's funny, though. <laughs> Wild. Uh, here's another one. Shades of Kyle Lowry and Bradley Beal and Carson Edwards. That's an interesting one. I wouldn't even have thrown that in there. Kyle. Shot maker, shot maker with a knack for making clutch plays on offense and defense. He's a winner. That was his little one sentence write up. Cole Anthony, not Cole Anthony. First round. Yep. Kyle Lowry. I don't see that at all. Kyle. That's what's throwing me. Kyle Lowry and Bradley Beal. What type of combo is that? It's not bro, like when, like knowing who it is, I don't see it at all. Bradley Beal makes sense to me. Kyle Lowry, I don't see it. Bro, huh? Um Tyrese Maxey. It is Tyrese Maxey. Okay. I was I'm like Kyle, Kyle Lowry, Lowry, Lowry Bradley Beal. What? Wild. Uh, yeah, I don't see Kyle Lowry at all. That's nuts. That was that was weird. I almost said like Desmond Bain, because like I don't know. Dang, I would, that would, I that know would have been a terrible thinking. one. Desmond, I'm looking at Desmond Baines right now. It says shades of Malcolm Brogdon, Alex Caruso, and Lamar Patterson. I don't even know who the third person is. That's terrible. I don't like that at all. That he plays like none of those guys. Yeah. Well, I don't know the last guy, but he probably don't play like him either. <laughs> uh, shades of Victor Oladipo, Eric Gordon, and Dion Waiters. I. First thought came to mind, but I'm not saying his name out of pure respect because there's no way they're talking about who I think they were talking about. He said it was Deion Waiters who? Victor Oladipo, Eric Gordon, and Deion Waiters. They're not talking about anything Edwards, are they? Oh, they certainly are. What, bro? That's the first person that came to my mind, and I was like, "I'm." I literally said it. I'm like, "I'm not saying it because that's too disrespectful." There's no way that's your draft comp. But hey, he's the only bro. guy that fit the criteria. I will say, pre-injury vo, pre-injury Oladipo was a problem. He's yeah, he, yeah. So I, like, I I could kind of see it knowing how it's panned out. But you telling me? I mean, I guess. Killian Hayes was his number one on his big board. But you tell me Killian Hayes gets Mono Ginobili, and I, for Anthony Edwards, I get oh, the best I get is Oladipo. That's crazy. Eric Gordon, Deion Wade. Eric Gordon. I like he he put some buckets up there though. Some 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 dudes that's really yeah. you know some some chuckers. They're gonna Lamello get shots up. Lamelo Ball got compared to Lonzo. Okay. okay. That was just lazy. <laughs> uh, hey, come on. We got to do better than that. <laughs> that was just lazy. Okay. I mean, you're not terribly wrong, but like, damn. Bro, some of <laughs> these are wild. Shades of mild-mannered Rashid Wallace. <laughs> high, <laughs> high energy Hassan Whiteside. James Wiseman? Yeah. <laughs> mild manner, bro. Why is it what, bro? What do we? Oh, why we're not even talking basketball at this point? <laughs> what are you Literally, talking about, talking about personality just, wise, right? Y'all just adding random stuff here. Just saying, I'm random. never gonna get. I'm never gonna get overwatched, Carmelo. It's so Shades of respect. They just saying stuff. Shades of Capricorn, D'Angelo Russell. They just saying stuff. Nothing basketball related at this point. 
Last one I want to do is the 2021 class. Um, so I'm going to go through here. Oh, they changed up the little. Oh, design got better on the website. Hold up. Oh, that, that, okay. that means these comps about to be A1 day one. We about to see. First one I got for you. The here. famous 21 draft class. Let's see. Let's find a good one. I'm looking you want to try doing this one without looking at the names. I feel like we talk about this one so much. I remember. Yeah. Right now. Oh, shades of Donovan Mitchell, CJ McCollum, and Jordan Clarkson. The little one word or one sentence blurb says spark plug score whose silky ball handling and competitive edge are tailor made for the pros. Jalen Green. It's not Jalen Green. Jalen Suggs. It's not Jalen Suggs. Now I gotta look. <laughs> now I gotta <laughs> <Yeah>. look. <laughs> hold on, hold on. You said Donovan Mitchell was the one, right? Donovan Mitchell, CJ McCollum, and Jordan Clarkson. All right, give me. All right, don't tell me who this is, but I just want this hit because I wanted. That's who I. I have a name in mind. Is he after pick ten? I actually don't know where he got picked off the top of my head. I think he was a top ten pick. James Booknight. I remember. Yeah, it is Booknight. Ah, I knew it was Booknight. He, yo, bro. Booknight was such a bucket, Book though. It was a bucket, bro. I'm telling you. I was watch. I remember I was watching him in the uh, I because I was watching him. I think it was uh, what was it, the summer league? That's what I was. I was blanking on. I'm like, hold oh, yeah. on, this kid could. And I was, I went back and saw some like I don't forgot where he went to play before this. But I saw some highlights before. I'm like, no, this kid's like, it was a bucket. Just never panned out ever. But I could honestly, I ain't mad at it. I'm not. Nah, he he was a bucket. I, I think he had some off court stuff that messed it up. But at UConn, man, he was a bucket. This one, <laughs> shades of supersized Shea Gilgis Alexander or shorter Ben Simmons with a jumper. K Cunningham. Yeah, that's we getting lazy, bro. <laughs> I was about to say <laughs> taller shorter, this guy. Shorter Ben Simmons with a jumper. That ain't Ben Simmons. That's not Ben Simmons. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> you added a jumper of, that's like <laughs> shades of six eight, six eight Chris Paul with athleticism and <laughs> elite wings. Like, bro, what are we talking about? That's not him no more, bro. <laughs> right, bro. You just you taking away the defining things that make him miss. It can't be like seven foot Steph Curry. Like, no, bro, it doesn't work like that, bro. bro I'm dead. Because of what, bro? Shades of shorter Ben Simmons that could shoot, though. Like, what? Like, what, bro? It's not them at all. <laughs> Yo, oh these cops is hilarious. This is funny. This might be the funniest game we played. These <laughs> cops right. is hilarious. The next one I got. Shades of Draymond Green, Pascal Siakam, <laughs> and then taller and bulkier Michael Carter Williams. Evan Mobley, <laughs> not Evan Mobley. Taller and of Michael Carter. Michael Carter was like six six. Is Draymond? Who's the other one? Draymond and Siakam, <clears throat> and then basically bigger Michael Carter Williams. This got is this Shingoon? It's not Shingoon. Mm. Shingoon, I'll tell you right now, his mm. why all three of Shingoon's comps is European Europeans. like yeah. Vucevic, <laughs> <laughs> Sabonis, and Ned Scanner, bro. <laughs> That's like, bro. That's like the, is <laughs> Turkish too. Like, bro. <laughs> that's like in the NFL, bro. They'd be like Lad McConkey. Cooper Cup, Hunter Renfro. They just they just throwing out the random white receivers. Oh, oh my, god. my god. Um, who is this? I don't know who this is. It was it's... Draymond Green, taller and bulkier Michael Carter Williams. Got to add had to put the bulkier yeah. in there. In Seattle. Is this Franz? It's not Franz. Who is this? This is, this is Scotty Barnes. What? That was Draymond. I mean, you it's before Scotty had a jumper, people were just yeah. like somebody that can dribble and play defense. Who, who was the other guy? You said Draymond, Michael Carter. Who's the other guy? Siakam. I mean, I guess like it's not the best, but I'm mean, okay. I'm I mean, I've heard worse, put it that way. I've heard worse, I've definitely heard worse. 
Next one I got just two shades of Chris Bosch and Christian Wood. That's Evan Mobley. That is Evan Mobley. Yeah, that's definitely Christian Evan Wood. Mobley. I feel like, dang. Uh, I mean, the high and the low, the floor Fair. and the ceiling. You know, <laughs> Fair. floor, ceiling. There you go. Right. That's how I feel. Comp should be. Comp should be like what well, he probably will be. The absolute ceiling and the absolute floor. Like, that's what a comp should be. That's fair. That is true. Uh, last couple here. Shades of Joe Ingles, Kyle Anderson, and Evan Turner, I guess. yeah. Josh Giddy. <laughs> it's Josh Giddy. Why, bro? <laughs> as soon as you said Joe Ingles, I knew it was Josh Giddy. <laughs> like, the giveaway. You telling me you couldn't think of nobody else but somebody else that's also Australian. That one you low key could have said like a Ben Simmons kind of taller playmaker can't shoot like that yeah. one I wouldn't have been mad at. We would have been like Ben Simmons without the defense. Like. Ben Simmons with longer hair and <laughs> <Right. laughs> like come on. Uh, let me see if there's any other good ones here. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Oh dang, he got people that didn't even get drafted. Oh, this comp goes deep. My man was doing his research. Jose Alvarado, shades of JJ Barea. I can see it. I guess, yeah, it's crappy. I definitely can see it. Um, but all right, last one I got. Get back to it. I got shades of OG Ananobi, DeAndre Hunter, and Cam Johnson. A lot of tall people. All right. That's Kaminga. It's not Kaminga. OG Ananobi. Cam Johnson. Who's the middle one? DeAndre Hunter. OG Ananobi. Is this Trey Murphy? It is Trey Murphy. Ah, okay. Okay. That's not bad. Now, those That's not, that one was not bad. Okay. Accurate. Right, right, that's actually not a bad one. That, that might be one of the best ones. No, eh, that was up there. It was like one of the most accurate ones, I'd say. Definitely. Kaminga got Danny Granger, Luol Dang, and Jeff Green. I'm not mad at that either, though. I'm it's not awful, mad at like, I like that. I actually do like that. What was – it was somewhere I want – oh, no, it was Trey Murphy. I just wanted to know what his was. I was actually very yeah. curious. Jalen Green got Zach Levine, Bradley Beal, Malik Monk. Very accurate. I would have guessed that, yeah. I would have guessed that yeah. instantly. Uh, what did Trey Mann get? Trey Mann. Let me see. Let me see. And then he I do want to go kind of further down. He had Trey Mann 28. <laughs> Trey Mann had D'Angelo Russell, taller Darius Garland. I mean, Trey Mann. How tall is Trey Mann? Right. What? <laughs> okay. You could have just said like Darius Garland. Uh, and Darius Garland is 6'1", right? Like, yeah, he's not that tall. That was kind of weird. Kevin O'Connor is interesting. Some of this well, stuff is funny. The only ones Herb I Jones, know. Herb that's Jones, one. Got yeah. Leaner, Draymond Green, and Andre Roberson. Yeah, because he always he couldn't always shoot. Yeah. So, yeah. Dude, take a wild guess at Austin Reeves. <laughs> is it like Caruso? Kurt Kynrick, like is it someone You're on the right path? Joe Ingles and Grayson Allen. That don't fit his game. And not at all. literally, you just pick two white players and two white players that don't play like <laughs> at all, <laughs> at all. That's crazy. Yes, comps. You can't. It's, it's like it is impossible for people doing comps to not match the race. It is like or the, like ethnicity. It, it's impossible, bro. If you are a European center, bro. <laughs> If you're good, Jokic, Singu, Shingu, you're getting compared to one of them. You're not getting compared to no black center. Yeah, I almost think like we should kind of do away with comps for the most part. Like, unless it's something so blatantly obvious, like just talk about what the person is good at. Cause like they, the comps get too funky. I just think people don't re- like, yeah, like I said, they do get too funky. People don't people don't know how to do comps, bro. Because so, I've seen some good ones to where it's like, oh, I see it. That makes sense. Right. But a lot of people really just don't. I see it in football a lot where I'm just like, this guy compared to what? Like that is, To me, that don't really make sense. Yeah. 
Uh, I just went quickly to their like the draft class from last year. Victor Wembanyama says shades of Gen Z Kareem Abdul Jabbar. That's the best one we heard so far. For real, though. Because <laughs> I get like what what comp are you saying? That's the seven foot Steph Curry. That's the one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually <laughs> accurate. Uh, seven foot Steph Curry with Ben Simmons defense and elite passing. He's just a demigod. <laughs> Shades of 2K15 demigod. Right. Yeah. Amen Thompson says tall Ja Morant or bean pole Zion Williamson, which I think just means. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. This is just getting weird at this point. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm closing that out. <laughs> that was fun though. That is, uh, those are mm-hmm. fun to do to go back because draft comps, like I said, are, are funny. And no matter which ones you go to, like all of those are from the ringer, but you could go to ESPN or CBS, whatever. It's like people are going to have equally funny ones because, like you said, looking back on it, none of them are going to really match up when you Mm -hmm. come down to it. It's so hard to predict uh, how people are going to end up playing. Games change, too. People develop differently. People add jumpers and, like, games change. It's hard to really – yeah, like I said, it's hard to predict. But with that, that that's going to do it for Episode 54 of the Off the Glass Podcast. Um, like I said, if you made it through the entire episode, as always, we appreciate you. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe to the channel, and follow us on the socials that you see at the bottom of the screen. Um, and tune in to playoff basketball, man. We locked in. It's the best time of the year. Playoff basketball on literally every single day, at least for the next week, barring people starting to get swept and knocked out of the playoffs. But I think we'll only have one sweep, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, but as always, I'm Billy. That's Dame, and we out. Peace.